Good evening. This is a call to order for the July 8th, 2024 City of Canal Winchester Planning and Zoning Meeting. Uh, Mr. Deeds, roll call, please. Mr. Wildenfeller? Here. Mr. Donahue? Here. Ms. Gooden? Here. Ms. McDonald? Here. Mr. Deeds? Here. Mr. Palsgrove? Here. Uh, motion to excuse Mr. Ritchie? So moved. Second. Roll call. Mr. Wildenfeller? Yes. Mr. Donahue? Yes. Ms. Gooden? Yes. Ms. McDonald? Yes. Mr. Deeds? Yes. And Mr. Palsgrove? Yes. Time ends 7.01 p.m. <clears throat> I'll need approval for June's minutes, please. Mr. Chairman, I move we, June, move we approve June's minutes, minutes as presented. Second. Motion made by Mr. Wildenthaler, second by Mr. Roll, Mr. Paulsgrove. Roll call, please. Mr. Wildenthaler? Yes. Mr. Donahue? Yes. Ms. Gooden? <clears throat> yes. Ms. McDonald? Yes. Mr. Deeds? Yes. And Mr. Paulsgrove? Yes. Now it's time for public comment for items that are not on our agenda this evening. So if there are any, any, anyone that wishes to speak about anything that is not related to the agenda this evening. Okay. If you'll be speaking with us tonight, if there's any chance you'll speak to us this evening, could you please stand and take an oath? If there's any chance you're going to talk to the commission. Do you swear to be truthful in the testimony you give and tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth? If so, please say I do. Thank you. And I'll turn it over to staff for our first application. The first application on tonight's agenda uh, is zoning map amendment 24-003. And I'm also going to be talking at the same time about preliminary development plan 24-001. Um, this is for the 98.4 acres of property located on the corner of Hayes, Lithopolis, and Oregon Road, um, as shown on the exhibit up on the screen. Uh, the property is currently a mix of uh, zoning with planned residential district in the, the light tan here, and then the grayish blue on the corner is exceptional use. Um, the applicant is requesting to rezone the entirety of uh, the area kind of outlined in black. Uh, the 98.4 acres to a planned unit district um, and approve the preliminary development plan for 121 single family dwellings, 334 multiple family dwellings, and a 4.6 acre commercial site. Uh, the applicant has provided here um, the request for the rezoning. Um, the rezoning development text uh, that's been submitted is called Miller Farms. Um, this parcel, um, again, is in the city of Canal Winchester, kind of in the south uh, quadrant, just south of the uh, roundabout. Um, the property is broken down into four different sub areas. Uh, the exhibit on the right goes over each four sub areas. Um, the first sub area A is this L shaped um, tract of land that is for the single family component. A sub area B, which is the very middle of the site, um, is for a single story multiple family dwelling project. A sub area C um, that is located towards uh, the intersection here is for a multiple story um, multiple family project. And then sub area D, right at the intersection of Lithopolis and Oregon Road, is a future commercial out parcel. Um, kind of breaking down, um, and I'll, I'll kind of stay on this slide here for a moment um, as I talk. Uh, the four different sub areas um, have um, the acreages on the right hand side, the number of units uh, that was kind of previously discussed, uh, but for a total, um, and the total acreage minus the public right of way um, on Oregon Hayes and Lithopolis Road is 95.7 acres. Um, out of that, they're showing 31.2 acres for open space, um, a diagram kind of highlighting what that open space locations um, are as a future exhibit um, for a total of 455 dwelling units. Uh, the applicant is requesting to rezone this to a planned unit district. A uh, planned unit district um, allows for a mix of residential and commercial. <coughs> uh, the amount of commercial in a PUD is limited uh, to, I believe, 20% of the development. Um, so that is kind of one of the, the factors here of what makes this uh, zoning request uh, substantially different from the previous requests that Planning and Zoning Commission has reviewed, uh, which was strictly for only residential and not that commercial component. 
Uh, with the uh, plan district, um, the purpose of intent um, right on the staff report there, the gray box on page one, uh, talks about its intent is to promote progressive development of land, construction, and encourage imaginative architecture design that lay out flexibility in the building styles, types, and sensitivity to the natural environment. Uh, the planned district um, are designed to guide and develop an orderly, coordinated, and comprehensive manner that preserves natural quality and beauty and provides supporting community facilities in the development of a diverse, sound urban environment consistent with accepted land planning, archi uh, landscape architecture practices, and engineering principles. Uh, so as we are looking through uh, the development uh, process, this is kind of the, the start of how staff is um, digesting kind of what was submitted here by the applicant. Um, within that, there are some minimum development standards that we'll go over, um, as well as planned content requirements for a PUD. Uh, the applicant submittal um, includes the development text and preliminary plan for this rezoning. Again, it's a PUD that provides a mix of home types, both single and multiple family. Uh, the plan introduction talks about the project's high quality mix of residents and uses, uh, the interaction with the site's existing natural features, and providing pedestrian connectivity. Uh, the proposed development um, kind of breaks down each of these four sub areas, which I want to go over in some more detail. Uh, sub area A, uh, what's kind of outlined here, that L shape uh, that's colored in on the map on the right, is for single family homes. Uh, the sub area proposes a maximum of 121 single family lots. Uh, it's divided into two distinct sections on the site. Uh, the first section here has access uh, strictly from Hayes Road to the north. Uh, the second section has access strictly from um, Oregon Road here on the south. Uh, this um, plan here for these single family lots kind of creates two separate nodes for the products. Um, the applicant has provided um, development text for this sub area, um, has found some consistency with um, this text and the adjoining sub areas uh, that kind of surround this piece. Um, some of the sections of zoning text uh, are adequately covered in what is being presented this evening. Um, partially that the development text for sub area A um, is requesting a reduction in uh, lot sizes, setbacks uh, from the base R3 zoning district to permit uh, more density. Um, at the same time, the applicant is requesting to deviate from their residential appearance standards, uh, which sets a uh, kind of home design and quality threshold uh, to reduce the front porch minimum size, increase the width of the driveway, increase the width of the garage on the front of the home, uh, bring the garage closer to the street, and reduce the uh, requirements for rear load and side load garage design. Uh, these requested changes in tandem um, essentially result in a more auto-oriented neighborhood uh, than what our residential appearance standards was uh, designed to, to help prevent. Uh, the residential develop appearance standards um, are designed to help new development fit in the context and character of the existing community, um, as well as hit the goals for what um, the city um, has set forth for how new development should be shaped to encourage uh, a development pattern that the general community can see consensus on as a whole. Uh, this includes limiting the garage appearance within the front elevation. Um, the applicant um, has not provided any justification for these deviations from the residential appearance standards, um, has not provided any um, compensations that are being provided to offset the uses of, in, of the reduction reduced standards um, and how reducing these standards will result in the best possible development for the site. Um, that is one of the um, kind of criteria that is set in the PUD text um, is that if you're going to ask to deviate from any zoning minimum standards, you have to justify how it creates a better overall development in doing so. Uh, when looking at sub area B, uh, this is the 229 single story uh, multiple family dwellings in the center of the site. Uh, this um, site plan that's provided uh, shows single-story apartment buildings ranging from five units to eight units per structure. Uh, this sub-area um, shows primary access off of Oregon Road. Um, there is a connector roadway to the single-family sub-area A to the south, uh, which is kind of shown in the center of the sub-area A. Uh, 
this sub area, um, excuse me, this um, <coughs> roadway within this sub area are noted to be private um, rather than being public roads. Uh, one distinction here um, for this kind of uh, proposal. Um, the applicant has provided, uh, again, some examples of the product um, style that they are requesting to build within this sub area. A uh, photograph here from the Reynoldsburg facility on the right was included in the packet. Um, these are the only two photos submitted that actually showed unit designs. Uh, the others that are submitted in your packet are all the clubhouse uh, common space area. So I wanted to pull those out to make the distinction that this is what the um, living unit was as part of um, their proposal here. Uh, the sub area B um, design is substantially similar to the characteristics in sub area A. Uh, the proposed building orientation and garage four design again result in an auto oriented impact to the neighborhood. Um, there's nothing in the text that was provided that requires any architectural compatibility uh, between uh, these two sub areas or the others in fact on the site. Um, this leads to a lack of cohesion within the proposed sub areas and uh, with this being a planned unit development um, there's no real plan put together for how all these sub areas are cohesive and interact with one another. Um, the plan um, so far reads as two separate kind of projects between sub area A and B. Um, and we'll continue to see that looking at sub area C and sub area D uh, moving forward. Uh, the um, site plan also, um, just from some clarity here, shows no tree lawns. Uh, the uh, pedestrian canal excuse me, pedestrian trail connectivity is limited to one kind of access point to sub area uh, C in the northeast corner. Um, other than that, it looks like there are um, no sidewalks within the sub area, uh, that the front walk from the uh, front door, like in this photograph here, kind of leads from the door to the private roadways. Um, and then the applicant, I believe, is calling this elevation the front of the unit in their development text um, having doors with a little concrete slab that uh, doesn't have any connectivity to um, the trail system uh, shown on the plan here or even in the example of the Reynoldsburg neighborhood uh, photograph they've provided um, with this uh, lack of kind of connectivity between the sub areas um, it kind of goes against what the development text um, intro was talking about was to um, connect the sub area to the natural features uh, that surround it. Uh, looking at sub area C, uh, this is the um, sub area for the 105 uh, multiple story, multiple family dwelling units. Uh, the development text notes a range permitted from two story to three and a half story townhome style buildings. Uh, however, there's nothing in the text that kind of defines what the townhome style is other than a label for the sub area. Um, the development text, um, excuse me, the development plan shows attached garages uh, for the units. However, the development text and the exhibits provided um, show unit designs that don't have any um, attached garages and there's no commitment to attached garages, uh, which makes the type of product that is being proposed here very uncertain. Um, looking at the development text as a whole, uh, just based on how it's structured, uh, the applicant could construct a three-story walk-up breezeway-style apartment um, and call it a townhome, and it meets kind of what they're presenting here um, in terms of um, the vagueness provided in the text. Uh, when looking at um, this sub area, um, there, there's no uh, architectural compatibility between this sub area and the others on site. Uh, sub area D um, was provided for the commercial out parcel there at the corner of Lithopolis and Oregon Road. Uh, this sub area consists of 4.6 acres. Um, on the corner, um, a list of restricted land uses have been indicated in the development text. Um, however, um, the list of prohibited uses um, seems to miss the mark on what the intent of the sub area is in providing a more exact list of permitted uses. Uh, there's a, a 
wide blanket list of permitted uses um, if you reference the subzoning district text allowed in the development plan. Um, there's some information in here on limiting uh, business hours, I believe, to 11 p.m., um, requiring that drive throughs be screened, parking lots be located behind the buildings. Um, some of those things are already required in the commercial development standards that they note um, this out parcel is going to be required to meet. Um, however, the vagueness makes us unclear on how the out parcel um, for commercial use is a benefit to this neighborhood. Uh, when looking at our uh, 2023 community plan, uh, this site is labeled as a uh, rural preserve slash settlement. Um, I put on here um, directly from the community plan kind of what that means, um, just for a reminder of the, uh, for the Planning and Zoning Commission. Uh, but it's basically um, saying that um, this type of development pattern um, preserves open space and creates a uh, land use type that is more tightly grid together uh, with connectivity. Um, appropriate land uses are single family homes, small commercial floor plates, um, non-automobile oriented uses, um, civic and institutional buildings. Uh, for the connectivity, again, the streets uh, within the settlement should be a loose grid pattern, avoiding cul-de-sacs, um, con creating connections throughout the neighborhood. Um, for building locations here, uh, some more urban character form um, that is providing for, for tighter setbacks, something that the applicant is kind of showing in their um, development text. Um, the building design um, puts precedence um, on, on um, things that similar in the region. Uh, building materials and colors um, should um, be compatible. Uh, residential and commercial structures um, should have front porches. Um, principal entrances should face uh, the street um, and by principal entrance it means the front door in the building not the the garage door which is one of the focuses staff um, identified the deviations are um, putting focus on and then for parking uh, to accommodate on street uh, or private garages uh, detached or attached um, promoting rear alleys or laneways whenever possible whenever possible um, and can be located to the side or rear of commercial buildings. Uh, the Rural Settlement uh, Preserve uh, section in our uh, community plan has these kind of three graphics that describe kind of how you can lay out the exact same acreage of land as a visual. I thought this was helpful for this dis uh, discussion this evening. Uh, the top one is a conventional model. Um, this one is noted to not be a desirable pattern for development, basically long streets that lead to cul-de-sacs, uh, very minor connectivity, um, except within the public right-of-way. Uh, the second layer down uh, that is more acceptable is a greenway model. Uh, this is uh, a model that uses, utilizes existing natural features, uh, creates more public open space and connectivity by taking lot sizes um, shrinking down what is privately owned versus what is you know shared space uh, so the appearance of um, your connectivity is increasing um, as well as um, preserving some of the features that are there uh, the most intense kind of style for this um, future land use is the hamlet model uh, this one has the most dense um, product type uh, where the setbacks are tighter um, it has the most preservation of open space uh, that can be focused either in the perimeter or um, at the center of the site. Um, and so again, one of the things that this, these graphics are great at showing is there the exact acreage on all three of them, the exact number of units in all three of them. Um, it just depends on how you want to structure the development to create different goals and objectives. Um, so again, just some um, pieces from our uh, future land use plan uh, that shows what this site should be developed as. Uh, when looking through uh, the development text, again, I noticed, noted that there's a 31.2 acres of open space uh, that are being dedicated um, to being accessible by the public. Uh, the open space graphic on the right kind of shows how it's uh, dispersed here. Uh, the applicant is showing open spaces being frontage along all three public roadways. Um, noted in the text to create a buffer uh, from the 
um, public right of way to the internal of the development. Um, they also are showing some open space here in between uh, units within sub area B. But again, as I noted, there's no uh, connectivity or sidewalks leading through these spaces to make it uh, places that are intuitive for people to travel. Um, and then um, noting here that they are also showing some common open space within the small kind of parklet areas uh, within this sub area. Um, sub area C actually does show the connectivity within that, that um, public open space. Um, one of the other exhibits providing the plan is showing uh, the connectivity uh, graphically here. Uh, all the blue lines are labeled are private roads. Uh, the red are proposed public roadways. Uh, the orange are multi-use paths that um, connect each one of these sub areas um, approximately one time to the regional kind of system here. Um, and then the applicant is showing uh, five foot sidewalks um, in the gray dash lines. Uh, but again, looking at the graphic here for sub area B, uh, it looks like that sidewalk might be shared with the public road, the private roadway system. Um, it looks like that might be the same here with sub area C. Uh, one of the items that staff wanted to just mention for Planning Zoning Commission's um, consideration that was found in the development text is they are looking to remove approximately 333 trees uh, throughout the site, uh, noted with the X's in the plan. Um, the applicant is noting that they want, would like to receive credit uh, for 1,761 uh, trees based off of the size of what's being removed. Um, that tree credit um, for existing caps out at four trees in our landscape code. Uh, so that's a pretty uh, big request that staff thought would be noted in here. Um, and we're going through and looking at the landscape standards for trees that need to be planted per dwelling units. Um, Staff's unsure if they're asking for a reduction of that number as well, uh, just for the um, ground floor area for, I believe, sub area B warranted 500 trees being planted for the number of square footage on the ground. Um, so just some clarification from the applicant on um, this portion of the plan that would be helpful. So for a uh, zoning amendment review, uh, there are the five criteria up on the screen uh, that need to be met um, to approve a zoning map amendment. Uh, the first is the compatibility. Um, staff notes that the plan development, preliminary development plan does not adequately note how the project is compatible with adjacent land uses for the area. Uh, the community plan notes this area as a rural preserve uh, where appropriate land use types include detached single family and small commercial buildings that are non-auto oriented. Uh, the rural preserve future land use covers three different types of land use development patterns. Again, the conventional model, the greenway model, and the Hammett model. Uh, the conventional model is noted to be a typ typical sub suburban configuration that's not desirable. Uh, the greenway model takes the next step by increasing density by clustering small lots, centralized commercial space, and interconnecting public green space for foot and bicycle travel. Uh, the Hammock model, the most intense of the three, uh, takes the final step by clustering development centrally. Uh, this results in more public green space by reducing <coughs> public yards to create a compact form. Parking is done to the rear of residential homes whenever possible, and the commercial component becomes a community gathering space. Uh, the preliminary development plan shows a more conventional model for development. Uh, again, with minor pedestrian connectivity, given the natural features of Lyle Creek that uh, exists. Um, the second criteria, the preliminary development plan did not include a traffic study to address access and traffic flow for the proposed development. Uh, additionally, the 2023 community plan, again, notes this site as a rural preserve where street networks should be a grid pattern that is centered along a public green space. A uh, parking note in the community plan is to be accessed via rear laneways whenever possible. Um, the applicant um, doesn't appear to be showing either of those items um, within the development plan. Uh, the preliminary development plan is requesting a number of identified and unidentified deviations from the uh, base zoning codes. Um, I provided a list of eight in your staff report just from uh, seven of the eight are from um, a plan district submittal requirements. Uh, the other was from the landscape section. Um, 
these changes being requested affect the public health, safety, convenience, comfort, prosperity, and general welfare. Again, the applicant has not provided what adjustments or compensations are being provided to offset these impacts. Uh, and that the relationship of the proposed use to the adequacy of available goods and services. Um, the proposed residential and small commercial growth is noted in the 2023 community plan. Uh, the city has anticipated future resident, residential growth in this area um, and has planned for the community level uh, goods and services. As uh, so the staff is recommending that the zoning map amendment uh, ZM24003 be tabled at this time. Uh, the application is lacking in demonstrating the compatibility of this plan with the community plan, a relationship to local roadway networks, and providing clarity that this plan increases the public health, prosperity, and general welfare. Uh, and then for the preliminary development plan, uh, the six criteria up on the screen um, are noted that the proposed development is consistent with applicable zoning standards. Uh, again, the preliminary development plan is not consistent with the purpose and intent uh, standards of the zoning code. Uh, the applicant has not addressed all deviations being requested um, and how those deviations will result in a better quality development. Uh, the proposed development um, is not in conformity with the community plan. Uh, the community plan notes the site to be a rural preserve settlement that promotes smaller building footprints, pedestrian connectivity, and rural residential land uses that preserve open space. Uh, the proposed setbacks uh, and yard space for single family sub areas uh, proposed are uh, more in line with the rural preserve uh, future land use designation. Um, however, the building designs being requested contradict the philosophy for pedestrian forward design. Uh, and that the preliminary development plan does not adequately identify and justify all modifications to minimum development standards to promote a higher quality development. Um, the preliminary development plan lacks in the connectivity and greenway character that is promoted within the community plan and that there is no coordination and integration of the sub areas to create a one plan district uh, given the range in building style, building height, lot layouts, street connectivity, and planned land use. Uh, staff um, notes that the development acts as five separate projects all with different goals. Uh, so with that, staff is also recommending the preliminary development plan be tabled at this time. Um, I'll be happy to answer questions from the commission. I know there was a lot of talking, but I tried to give you the run through on each of the sub areas and the highlights here. Um, there's a lot provided in the application we can run through specifics. Thank you, Mr. Moore. <clears throat> Any questions or comments at this time for staff? I have a quick question on the creek. What is the depth of the creek there, and is there any um, flooding concerns? I saw the 100- um, and 500-year flood area, but how deep is that creek? Any idea? No, the, the applicant did not provide any okay. um, information specific to that. Is there a study on that? I didn't see one. I didn't see one in this middle. Mr. Morton, this can certainly be a question later for the applicant and perhaps part of their presentation, but the, the let's call it five areas, three, three residential, four areas, um, residential, two multifamily, one single family, and then the commercial. What, what's the logic behind the small commercial area being retained there? Uh, staff is unsure of the um, sub area kind of positioning and layout. Um, that was one of the questions um, during an initial kind of preliminary review of the development um, is kind of how the connectivity between these sub areas occur. Um, you can see in the graphic on the screen that um, it looks like the sub area C connects to sub area D. Um, however, if you kind of zoom in on a digital copy, the roads stop a little short. It's just to access the garages. Uh, for those units um, in terms of kind of the uses that are being presented again staff notes and staff report there is no clarity on why the sub area is there to support the the rest of the residential and, and through this process could we make recommendations on what we can limit based on the development text that's ultimately adopted or presented to council yes yes okay Thank you. 
Yeah, so the applicant's requesting to create a preliminary development plan and text, so they are, um, with, the, with this request, essentially writing the zoning for the project, and that's where the deviations they are requesting differ from the minimum standards our code um, sets forth. Uh, so uh, both Planning, Zoning Commission, and City Council have the ability to um, contribute to the development text, how it's written, and how uh, the project gets shaped. Okay. What other questions for staff? All right. So, for the record, we are on the first application. I know we're talking about both of these applications interchangeably, but um, if the applicant would like to come forward and speak, you know, specifically to this request, and I, I understand there will be um, preliminary development plan discussions as well, um, but the first application on tonight's agenda is the zoning map change, so um, <clears throat> there's anything you can provide related sure. to that. And, uh, and, and I would be curious, and I'm probably the rest of the commission on some of the deviations that staff has pointed out and kind of where Wilcox is on on that. Yep, sure. Th thank you for, uh, for having us here tonight. Thank you, Andrew, for the, uh, the thorough um, summary of the plan. Um, my name is Jonathan Wilcox. I'm a managing partner at Wilcox Communities. And um, thought, you know, we've got about a 15 slide presentation, but I'll go through them pretty quick. Um, thought it might be helpful for those of you who I don't know to tell you a little bit about who we are. I think, you know, the plan is we need to spend a lot of time on, but I think who who's behind it matters too. And so I've just enjoyed telling you a little bit about our family business, and then we can uh, talk about our proposal. Um, Andrew, does this, oh, did I do that? Yeah, it won't go full screen, but this is... <clears throat> That's good enough. Um, so, hopefully, can you all see that on your screens? Okay, great. So, Wilcox Communities, we're a family-owned company based in Worthington. This is our 24th year uh, in business. The uh, company was started by my dad. Uh, today, my brother and Jamie and I run it and um, specialize in master plan developments and building and managing single-story apartment communities in uh, suburban central Ohio. We've done two projects previously in Canal Winchester. Uh, we built the villas at um, Charleston Lake on Waterloo, 112 condo units next to Walmart. And we also more recently did the Turning Stone project with Ryan Holmes at uh, southwest corner of High Street and uh, 33. Uh, I won't spend much time on this, but we, we, we are proud of some of our accomplishments and the projects we've done. Um, company was named one of the best places to work in Central Ohio. Um, we won an award in 2022 for a similar development in Westerville. Uh, it was a multifamily development of the year, and uh, we were actually the ninth busiest commercial real estate developer for Columbus Business First, so pr proud of those accomplishments. I thought I'd just, uh, Andrew did a good job sort of <clears throat> giving the overview of the parcels. I thought it would make sense just to go back in time uh, to when we started this process and give you an overview of the parcels and the owners uh, at play because it, it is more complicated than typical deals that I've been involved in. Um, that's, that's the current parcel line uh, for each of the six parcels that encompass the 95-acre proposal. Um, the, the two rectangular parcels on the top left as well as the, the large main parcel in the middle are owned by Dwight Imler. That makes up about 80 acres of, of property. And then the, the three um, sort of corner where the commercial is proposed and two L-shaped parcels are owned by another property owner, a guy by the name of Jim Reed. And when we started the process back in spring of 2023, we really were just starting with the uh, Dwight Imler parcels. And our thought was we would like to do a mix of single family and our active adult focused multifamily product. Um, but you know, encouraged early on by the city to maybe think a little bit bigger and broader. And so um, you know, ended up working with Jim Reed on the other three parcels with trying to reach what we were told were the city's goal. We're carving out some neighborhood commercial on that corner um, to service the area, you know, in the in the 
concept being if you need to, you know, grab something quick, cup of coffee, a bite to eat, you know, not have to go up and on Gender Road and deal with kind of the retail corridor and traffic. So that was at least the, the thought process behind it and how the project kind of grew. So, you know, Andrew gave a really good overview. I'm not going to go through all of this, but um, one of the things I did want to say as we looked at the 95 acres is we started with, you know, that stream. Um, and I'm sorry, I don't know the depth of the stream, but we can certainly follow up with our engineers and, and let you guys know. Um, but that, I think it's called Lyle Stream, meanders through the site, and you have a wooded acre, a, a wooded um, corridor, a very natural corridor. And so that was really the starting place of, you know, how do we preserve this, how do we maintain the view corridor of this, and how do we develop around it in, in a respectful way. The other thing we took a, a close look at from very early on is, you know, what's around us. You know, we know there are neighbors to the north and all around us, and so we took, um, took time to develop the property with neighbors in mind. You know, if, if a building is backing up to one of the public right-of-ways, you know, flip that around and make that the front with an, a higher end elevation, um, looking at landscape buffering and screening and walkways. So those are kind of some big picture starting points. <clears throat> and um, just because we've been at this for 14 months and, and you all haven't been in the meetings, I think sometimes it's helpful for commission members for me to just kind of hit on some of the high points of how it's evolved up until now. Um, we have, um, so we're, this is about our eighth or ninth version of the site plan and sometimes we start in a much different place and, and you all don't get to see that evolution. So just, just for your knowledge and background, this is kind of a, one of our earlier site plans and um, this might even go back to last summer. So it's amazing we've been, been at this for this long here. But, um, you know, a couple of things I want to point out. The, all of the Jim Reed acreage originally we had the entire thing planned as commercial and another big difference was we had uh, if you if you look on the other side of the creek from the commercial we had that area as single family as well so the two single family sub areas were interconnected with a walk um, and then we had our ranch style multifamily down at the lower left corner um, since then, obviously, the plans changed. We flipped the ranch-style multifamilies now in the middle, and we have the single family in the lower left. Um, and you know, we wanted to create, from the commercial back to the single family, a kind of a density step down. So the farther you got out to the single family and to the, the edges of undeveloped land, um, it got less dense. We cut the commercial way down um, looked at some some studies that your all consultants have done and just were worried about the amount of demand for commercial down there and so um, that then raised the question if that's not all commercial what should it be um, looked at various options you know no one likes three-story multifamily walk up but that was certainly suggested and on the table and ultimately we decided that you know for sale townhomes would be a nice offering um, we're not aware of really many being built recently in Canal Winchester. It's um, been a big part of the home building market in suburban central Ohio mm -hmm. as of late, no, most, mostly because single family homes have gotten so expensive that townhomes have, have truthfully kind of become starter homes for young families. Mm -hmm. um, but that's, that's what then brought the townhomes and trunk the commercial. So, um, you know, master plan andrew um really described it well you know I, respectfully we think we have created quite a bit of connectivity throughout but we'll certainly um, sit down and put more pen to paper there's a lot of things we need to follow up on with staff and, and a lot of things that we're still absorbing um realizing that this is really the starting point but um one of the things that i did want to highlight is at the intersection of uh, Hayes and Lithopolis. So if you look at where those roads meet sort of in the, technically I think it's the northeast corner, um, you know, that is a lower area. So thinking about floodplain and areas that are not 
really efficient to develop. We thought, you know, let's really put our best foot forward with open space and parkland. Um, so we've we've proposed a uh, let's see, let me go past there. So we've we've proposed a 7.3 acre park space in that in that corner. Really, with the thought being uh, at that intersection, it's a very visible part of the property. Um, we could create a vista with you know, a pond, a gazebo, walking paths, nice landscaping, and then the creek and the woods in the background. Um, the, there's a blow up on that slide of sort of the gazebo concept. Um, walkways would be interconnected with the multi-use paths that run along um, Oregon, Lithopolis, and Hayes. Also be connected to the paths that, that kind of meander throughout the development, so. <clears throat> Um, so, with regard to the comp plan, this was we, we run into this sometimes where we start working on a site, and you know Andrew and Lucas pull aside and say, hey, "Just FYI, this comp plan's evolving. It's going to get passed later this year." So we did our best to. Well, they didn't say it's going to get passed. They were saying they were hoping it would get passed. So um, we did our best to to track that and incorporate features that we believe were going to be coming down the line in the comp plan, and you know, j just just a few things to point out. You know, rural preserve. A residential development with pedestrian connectivity and open space while preserving the existing character of the site. You know, we worked hard to do that. Um, you know, a couple of other just general housing related stats that stuck out at us from the comp plan is, you know, single family homes account for about 77% of the total housing stock in Canal. And, you know, based on our discussions with people, and, and I'm certainly open to feedback, is that we're kind of getting to a point where, you know, years ago you had six, seven hundred platted lots, unbuilt, um, and, and kind of kind of working the way through it. So it feels like getting to a point where some new quality housing could, could serve Canal well if it's done in the right way. And then the, the, third, the third point being just a very, very small percentage of land dedicated to multifamily. And we, we certainly understand there's all different kinds of apartments, right? There's, there's low income, there's tax credit, there's three story, there's just everything you can think of. And you know, we, we really take a lot of pride in the apartment home communities that we built. Um, we built condominium communities geared towards empty nesters for about the first 15 years of the company's existence. And realized that there was a, an apartment demand as people aged and, and perhaps were ready to sell their home, um, but didn't want to live in the apartment communities with all the 20-something. So um, we've actually done 13 such developments in central Ohio, just broke ground in Plain City, um, have a property under construction in Reynoldsburg and three up in Delaware County. And um, we think it could do well here. It, you know, it's um, as your town, ages, you know, not, not everyone may want to buy a condo or a patio home. And so we're finding there's a real market here and, and it's, it's been an exciting uh, part of the market. <clears throat> just hitting on some of the elevations, I know Andrew already went through them, but just, you know, the residential design standards, I think um, it's no secret that it's a very high bar um, and it's very, very challenging as we talk to single family home builders to get people committed to them as written. And so we've um, talked to a lot of people. We're gonna continue talking to a lot of people. I'm really confident that we can get to a place where we've got some builders really excited, but um, we really tried to thread the needle on, you know, maintaining the spirit of some of the stuff like four-sided architecture and, and, and window trim and materials and massing and porches but we are admittedly asking for some really fun things. Um, I think the, bi the biggest thing that, that every home builder brings up is the garage, the face of the garage being four feet set back from the living space. And, you know, we went back and forth a lot. I know a home builder that went through this process a few years ago was looking at four feet in front of the living space. So we just, we proposed the garage being flush with the living space, and then you'd have the covered porch protruding out front, so you'd still get a little bit of that setback. There's other details in the text, and I know we have a lot of follow-up to do with Andrew to, to fill in some holes and things, but, but we really worked hard and talked to the market to try to put our best foot forward with something that, that we think um, 
you know, we could get a quality builder to execute on. Um, and the, to Andrew's point, you know, Wilcox communities, while we master plan and develop, we actually build the single story apartment communities. So we would work with uh, at least one, if not a number of home builders on the single family and townhome sub area. But we would build the ranch apartment homes. And so we have the benefit then of being able to stand here just a preliminary stage and say, this is exactly what, what we would propose to build. Um, doesn't mean it has to be this, but this is our project in East, uh, called Eastwood in Reynoldsburg, and it's a, um, we call it like our new modern craftsman style, and we thought it turned out really well, but we can certainly keep working through the details and color schemes and things. That's another view of one of the buildings. And then some samples of townhomes, and <clears throat> you know, it's, it's hard to it's hard to show exactly what's going to be built at this stage because we can't truthfully sit here and say, this is exactly it, this is the builder. Um, but we do have relationships with our home builders and we've um, studied the market and we've certainly provided some, some renderings that we think could fit what we're trying to accomplish. Um, but that being said, we, we understand that when we get to that point with a home builder, they're going to have to come here. You, you all are going to have to look exactly at their plans and final development plan and ensure it meets the intent. So, And then we didn't show any building layouts on the commercial, but these are just some conceptual images that we've been sharing over the past year for the, for the corner. Um, I don't think we'll attract like an office user. And it just, it's not gonna happen. Uh, I wish it was, but uh, I've got a lot up uh, in front of Turning Stone at 33 and High Street I still haven't been able to sell. But, um, but you know, maybe neighborhood retail, coffee, um, you know, restaurants. Um, I, I don't anticipate really large scale commercial users because I think that is gonna wanna be on Gender Road. Um, and admittedly, we've struggled a little bit with the commercial market down there. We're trying to meet the request of try to incorporate commercial, but, but you know, the rooftops need to come before the retailers are going to go and invest in a corner. So, um, but our hope would be we'd attract some users, and that's kind of conceptually what, what we'd like. I know it's a taco place. I'm guessing Chris did that on my team. He's a big taco <laughs> fan. Um, and that's all my presentation, and I should have done it at the beginning, and I didn't introduce my team, so sorry. Very quickly, we've got Chris Moore, our Chief Development Officer at Wilcox, Todd Ferris with Ferris Planning and Design as our Planner and Landscape Designer, and uh, David Hodge is a Zoning Attorney. Um, so all that being said, sorry that was maybe more detailed than, than, than I promised, but um, really thankful to be here, excited to hear your feedback, and happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you. <clears throat> so, Mr. Wilcox, did I hear you right? So, you, so Wilcox would be ultimately responsible for sub-area A and B. Is that the, the single family and then the ranch-style apartment? We would be responsible for building sub-area B. Sub-area A, we would work with at least one, if not a number of home builders to build those homes. So both of the single family sub areas. <clears throat> and is that also true for C? That, yes, correct, for the townhome. And ideally, you know, a lot of home builders are doing mm -hmm. both right now as townhomes have come back into the market. Um, so ideally, a builder could be doing some single family as well as the townhomes. But I think the townhomes are gonna have to just be one builder uh, we could have an opportunity to work with multiple builders on a single family. And just for clarification, do you see the townhomes being apartment townhomes or condominium type? I, I picture them being condominium owner occupied. Okay. We don't want the competition with our rentals south of it. But no, in all seriousness, I, I haven't seen the rental townhome market really as active as the for sale townhome market. And, I think single family to townhomes would both be for sale. The park that you talked about at the corner of Hayes and Lithopolis Road, is that accessible and open to the public? Is there parking for public? There's no parking, but it would certainly be accessible and open. Um, 
I will say at the beginning we had um, shown that as a, a parcel that we would give to the city and the parks department and, and truly provide a public park. Um, the early feedback we got was that you know the parks department had its hands full and maybe that wouldn't <laughs> wouldn't be a desire. And so where we ended up was let's um, let's connect it to the path area, let's you know have it open to the public as best we can. Um, the HOA would actually maintain it, but we we do think there'd be a neighborhood benefit to it. So, <clears throat> Mr. Wilcox, some of the deviations that are noted in the staff report on the first application. Um, have you have you guys had a chance to address those? In terms of, you know, for example, the maximum building height in the multifamily is 40 feet, and, and in your proposed development text, um, I think you're asking for 50. Um, but I'm, and the reason I'm asking the question is because it seems that you are unsure at this point of the ultimate user or developer in some of those sub areas and is it just based on what you're seeing in the market or is it the desire that um, you can pivot if 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 the if the development tax is approved it gives you flexibility i'm just curious on what the thought process is yeah yeah good, good question I, I i think for us it, we're trying to write it in a way that it's flexible enough to, to if, if builder A comes and he says, I have this great townhome plan that's working in so-and-so, you know, Grove City or New Albany or wherever, we want to be careful that we don't write it too strict, that we can't accommodate their product. Um, but, we, but, but we also, you know, we're trying to thread that needle to provide enough certainty. So, you know, Andrew made a good point, and I didn't realize this, but... We, we can certainly tighten up language with attached garages and townhome product and things like that, and we're open to language for how to do that because we're, we're not looking to do a three-story breezeway walk-up. Um, but, you know, I've, I've had situations where I've gone through, I've created a PUD text the best I think I can, and the builder comes along and says, hey, I've got this, this, this dynamite plan, and, let me look. Oh shoot, that that doesn't work. And and so we're trying to we're trying to strike that balance. Certainly certainly open to continuing to tighten things up. Maybe maybe 50 feet is being you know too broad. I, I think we went back and forth between two and three story because some builders have two story and some builders have three story. I'm guessing the 50 feet was probably trying to cover ourselves for three story. Thank you. Quick staff question. Um, when you do a PUD de development, do you have to do the preliminary development plan as one chunk and then the final as a chunk, or can you do multiple finals? So you do the preliminary um, as a chunk with the area rezoning, and then the final development plan could be for the phases that you are requesting to develop. Um, one of the things that this application does not provide is a phasing plan. Mm -hmm. I'm showing kind of the intent on phasing the development. Right. Um, but if they went through and phased like the single family into two sub phases, um, they could continue to build those. They would just have to bring those full documents to us first. Um, so based off of what the applicant is I think describing as their intent to, to build sub area B first, that would be the first final development plan that would mm -hmm. come before planning and zoning commission. Uh, I'm assuming that's a one phase project, maybe two. Probably probably two. Yeah, I, yeah, we need we need to provide the phasing plan, but the way I envision it being phased, you know, utilities are coming from the north. So the upper left single family phase would likely be phase one of the single family and then um, probably half of some area B would be phase one of ours. Um, we would have a second phase for the other half and then a single family phase later after that. Um, townhomes 105 units, that, that maybe would be done as one phase. I'm not 100% sure standing here today. Um, but again, I think it's working from uh, is that 
Lithopolis Road in because that's the direction the utilities are coming. So if, if I were to, so I will give I will give you credit for working with the the uh, the actual grade of the uh, the land. We many times we see people that just kind of wipe it clean and then start <laughs> from there. So I appreciate you taking you know taking the uh, contours of land and the natural features into account. Where, where I think when we start talking about looking at something that was a little more of a natural development, something that's kind of like that Hamlet is like you know there isn't a square here or a square here. It's kind of like maybe like a U, right? One wraps around another. Um, I'll give you an example. I hate, to, I hate to pick New Albany because they're not, I don't think they're the example we actually want to point to most of the time, but one of the things I did like is where they have the retail on one side of the street, on the other side of the street, they had the townhome, right? So you kind of are mixing that together. They're facing each other on the same road versus making it look like, well, we took this plot and we did this and we took this plot and we did that. So it's kind of that more natural because uh, if you look at how things evolved, right, you will have commercial in one corner, a couple of residences, might be a commercial in another corner, might be, you know, and I, I think that's some of the, some of the intent of, of the approach of looking at how can we do something that's more Hamlet based so it looks like it's evolved over time versus, well, that was the next piece of land that was sold and mm -hmm. how it was got developed. I know it's probably not a great answer, but no, you, I appreciate the feedback. We can, point out, we can point out some examples of how that kind of looks and that might help maybe evolve how the, and maybe you tuck a couple of the, which I imagine makes it a little bit more difficult to develop as well, right? If you're going to tuck some of the townhomes in between some of the commercial plots or items like that. But I think that's that's the intent. Yeah, pre appreciate the feedback, Mr. Deeds. One, one thing I didn't point out, and it's, I wish I had a better visual of it, but if, if you look at the site plan, it's, it's tough on a 2D drawing because the nature of these, when you have four different uses, you have to like mm -hmm. show on a plan, here's A, B, C, D, and then it starts kind of feeling a little disjointed, but we, we did do some things like if you look at the sub area D, which is basically the commercial yellow box, um, you know, coming off the left of that, we originally had townhomes through that center area and, you know, received some really feedback about you know, think, think more about that area as you look back from the commercial as more of kind of a town square with townhomes on each side. And I don't know that the drawing really shows it, but we did modify that. Now, unfortunately, we have to put detention in the middle of that. Um, I, I still think, though, that th there are elements of connectivity that, unfortunately, our, our 2D plan may not do it justice, but some of the, some of that thought went into it. Not saying that we're, you know open to, to more ideas like that, but um, you know the thought being if if you live in the sub area B, for example, uh, which is would be the single story multifamily. You know there will be a sidewalk network. There's actually a multi use path shown that crosses the creek, which would be a bridge and goes right to that kind of central area right off the commercial with townhomes on each side. So, you know, I, th I think we can accomplish some of the things that we're talking about. It, it's, 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 a, it's a really nice, the Hamlet idea is, is, is a very cool idea. I, I've, I struggle to really make it economically work in a way I think that's perfect with the comp plan, but, but that being said, elements of it and features like that, you know, we're, we're certainly open to, and, mm -hmm. and that's just kind of one example of something that we've tried to do. So I have a quick question on ownership. Are you going to own this whole property, or are you going to subdivide it? So Wilcox Communities would maintain ownership of subarea B. We would subdivide and the single family, and those individual lots will be built on and sold to homeowners. Um, the the townhomes would likely be either a fee simple regimen with an HOA or condos. So that's how that would get developed. Um, so I, and I think that exercise will basically follow the phasing. Um, but I, you know, this. A project of this scale with this many uses, I mean, this might be an eight to ten year 
build out. So I don't have the ability to just you know buy it all and sit on it. And I wish I did. Um, but as things get phased and subdivided, and we bring in more users to buy parts and pieces, then it'll continue to get absorbed. If that makes sense. So then you have two um, retention ponds. Yes. Are you planning to have more, or are you planning to have some sort of a cooperative agreement between all property users so that you're building one or two that could then become that park-like setting where you can walk all the way around it and have a couple seats and, a, and an area for kids to play and, and things yeah. like that? Yeah, good question. Chris, do you happen to know the kind of how the detention is designed to serve different sub-areas? I knew I would need these guys. <laughs> And Lotus down, he's much taller than me. We actually have four detention ponds on the site. Uh, furthest west for the single family, mm -hmm. uh, kind of in the middle of the page, will be oh, shared with subarea B and the south side of subarea A. Mm -hmm. uh, the town, the larger pond in the northwest corner mm -hmm. that will be in that 7.3 acres open to the public will take detention from the single family on the north side and a little bit of the townhouses. Uh, there's a small detention pond in the center kind of uh, walkway area between the townhouses connecting Subarea B and the commercial. And then there's a small pond within Subarea B by our clubhouse. Okay, so I think that the, the smaller, so that, I mean, it leads to the same question. Is it more efficient to build one or two within the site and then have shared agreements for all property owners to use that? Yeah, the, the thought process to what we've designed is maintaining the grade and, and the stream. Mm -hmm. you know, to create one big pond, you have to completely wipe out everything and grade everything differently. So we're trying not to fight the grade. Okay. And everything we've done is really to try to, to maintain that stream as much as possible. Okay, thank you. And I think it would be nice to have to be able to walk around the whole thing. That would be great. So I will share that some of my comments is that um, going from an 80 foot lot width to a 50 foot uh, is pretty dramatic. Um, if this plan had been written 20 years ago, which are the ones that I've worked with in the past, they were all 70 and 80 feet and we were scaling them down to like 60. But 50 is very, very, very small. Um, and so my concern is that they're too small and that the setbacks that you've asked for in this plan are a little bit too tight. So I get the five foot setback on the side, um, and I see that, but the 20 rather than 30 foot, or the 25 rather than 30 foot in the front, seems like you're, re you're taking away from that walkability uh, that I think that the comprehensive plan is talking about because you're pushing everything right to the street, especially when you push the uh, garages out front and, and then make that an exception. So that bothers me a little bit, just a little bit of feedback on that. Um, and I do think that the density of the overall is, is a little more than what I was envisioning when we did our comp plan update, uh, which just got passed last year. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I, would, I would echo that. Uh, I was gonna talk about the setbacks, but um, Ms. McDonald pretty much nailed what I had to say. I would just say that I f it feel, to me it feels like the driveway in some of the areas would be um, right on top of each other and then, then the scalability of the driveways, you know, I think you'd only have room for, for a car on each side. And I understand that that might be the intent <clears throat> and that's what's proposed in the development text, but my feedback would be that um, when you go to communities like that um, and then you find a buyer if these are gonna be, you know, most of these, I think you indicated, they would not be rentals, they'd be people purchasing these. I think that's one of the things people think about is, you know, even if they entertain two or three people, uh, where do they park? And I'm looking, I was just trying to find, I don't believe there's any parking deviations noted in staff report, is that correct, Mr. Moore, on any of these sub areas? Uh, uh, the, the only requirements for parking we have for single family is you have to have um, at least one garage space. Okay. That in the current text. correct okay thank you so again just a comment yeah appreciate it thank you. Mm -hmm. actually thinking of it if you have a 50 foot lot size in your garage and your driveway width is 25 it's going to be half cement mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
you mentioned the clubhouse for sub area B. Is there one for C? C, the, the townhomes? Yes, I, we envision there being a, a clubhouse there as well. I think we provided that option in the text. I just can't tell you exactly uh, what it would look like, but we do think there will be one. So I'm, I'm sorry if you already said this, Mr. Cox. <coughs> so do you envision sub area B would be developed first? I think what Wilcox would retain. <clears throat> I think uh, part of sub area B, about half of it, w would be developed first in conjunction with the single family up at the upper left corner, um, and, and it's simply because you know we want to get started, but the utilities are going to have to get dragged from on the other side of Hayes through the single family and down to us, so. The thought being would be that single family and then <coughs> half of sub area B. And then <clears throat> would the infrastructure and the road network be completed at, at that time as well? In terms of all of the interior roads? Yes, yeah, so sub area uh, A, B, and C. Sub area A, B, and C. Usually we would only complete the roads for the areas that of the phase of the development. Um, really just for economic reasons and, and not having to outlay all that capital is just part of the underwriting for phase one. That being said, a lot of the grading work and utility work would get done because just because of where the utilities are coming from and because we have to balance the site uh, from a grading standpoint. Yeah. And what's your comment on the tree deviation, the tree credits? Do you have any opinion on, on that at this point? Honestly, we are extremely confused, to be, to be frank. I think we read the code much different than Andrew explained the code, and so we just, but sounds like we're going towards a tabling tonight, so we were hoping to just follow up with the meeting with, with Andrew and Lucas okay. and hash through it. Okay. We, I don't know if, yes, did you want to add so anything? Probably is. Yeah, you don't sure. have to. Uh, what, what you said is what you said. So okay. We need just a little bit of a different interpretation, so we need to wrap our arms around That's exactly great. what the That's intention great. of that section of your code is. Okay. What other questions or comments for the applicant? Oh. Yep, I have a couple. Yeah, please. <laughs> Can we go back to that last map? So, um, couple questions and they may be really be for staff so on the single fa family housing we have dead-end streets which isn't typically that we like that is there uh, some understanding that if those parcels um, to the left are developed that we would require they tie into that that's correct yes yeah, so the, the parcel to the left um, is within our service utility planning area mm -hmm. and that we can serve it with utilities um, and so um, rather than creating these two dead-end looped neighborhoods, um, if any future uh, subdivision growth happens to the west, that they would immediately tie in. Um, it would probably also serve as the main access point on the south of Lyle Creek on this farm as well. Um, similar to what this is doing, this is creating a natural barrier. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what the, the connectivity points were um, pushed for by staff. Okay. The utilities are set up to be connected as well, so the utilities would stub at those dead end streets. Okay. Um, and then um, in the uh, area A to the north, it has two ways in and out of that of that area. So there's two roads that connect to Hayes, but there's only one for the other developments. And have you discussed with the fire department how that would? impact their operations should the fire department be required to come here so a, a traffic study has not been submitted um, for this development yet um, one of the things the traffic study would look at would be the separation of the two access drives onto Hayes um, mm -hmm. not only that but it look at the separation between the access drive for sub area C and B uh, visually you know on the screen they look about approximate um, and then, however, you know, access drives in sub area D uh, from sub area C would be set up. We have 
um, a minimum distance access drives can be located next to each other. Um, that <coughs> has not been evaluated. Um, the connector between sub area A and B here um, was shown <coughs> based off of feedback that over um, 100 units the fire department requires a second access. Mm -hmm. um, the preliminary conversation with the applicant was this was going to be an emergency access drive only. It was going to have to be bollarded it off and not be a full connector. Um, staff has asked for that to be a full connector. Um, this graphic makes it look like it's, oh, excuse me, not this graphic, <coughs> this graphic here um, makes it look like it's private still because it's the only roadway that's highlighted. Um, making it look like it's an emergency connection and that's something else staff is trying to work with the applicant to make that a full-blown connector. Um, similar to the comments that uh, Mr. Deeds provided tonight, how to blend the different unit types between all the different sub areas so they all share roadways mm -hmm. um, is something that is showing to be a challenge um, given this graphic here showing that all the multiple family will have private roads and all the um, single family are proposed to have public roads. Um, kind of how does that interconnectivity work um, and where do public and private roadways shift? Um, they're all designed with different pavement widths, all different tree lawn widths, all different sidewalk widths. Um, so that's part of the challenge that staff's trying to work with the applicant is how to create a rural preserve settlement type development um, with all these varying factors uh, considering the challenges with the multiple family yeah. mm -hmm. specifically. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I, I wanted to go back to a question earlier. The, um, there was discussion of lot sizes and then driveways. So the, and I'm talking about sub area A, mm -hmm. the single family. The, this, the code calls for my understanding was a max width of 10 feet, and the divergence we asked for was 16 feet for a two-car garage. So the 50-foot lot, I just didn't want you to think it was truly gonna be half concrete. I think we were looking at 16-foot width driveway for that 50-foot lot, which helps a little bit, but may not get you where it we're does, It does help a little bit, yeah. <laughs> I just, what people tend to do, because 16 is barely enough to get two cars there to open up your doors, They'll put either bricks or pave it or extend it at some point in time. So I think it's just reality you have to deal with. Does it, for the um, the unit you're proposing, I noticed the the little Lego block representations here vary in size. Do you do you have a standard for for unit building that you do? Do you do or do you variations of that? Yeah, they range from five to eight, mm -hmm. um, and it just depends on how the site lays out. All all of all of our units are two bedroom, two bath, and have an attached two car garage. Um, they're really built more as a condo product, sure. but, but for rent. Um, they range in size from a little over 1,100 to about 1,400 square feet. And they all have outdoor living space and you know, amenities like that. So our biggest selling point is you, know, you can rent a high quality home, have an attached two car garage, and have no one above or below you. Mm -hmm. And then we bring a lot of amenities into the com into our communities with you know, clubhouse, dog park, community garden. Um, we actually have a girl who works for us on our property management team that does nothing but resident experience, and so we have you know events and things like that. Because ultimately, our goal is everyone that moves in, we want them to stay till you know they need to go to assisted living or something else happens. So. I, I believe we have another product like this in the community, and it is quite popular. So, I think I think it would be interesting to see if you go uh, something of the Hamlet com concept, maybe have more uh, a two to three units, make them a little bit smaller, and you can vary. You know, some of the again, it looks like more what's built up over time, and then naturally you can slightly change the shades and colors. Mm -hmm. and it doesn't look like fast barns. Oh, I'm sorry, whatever. <laughs> they don't look like vast, you know, large buildings. Yeah. 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 We're actually working, we had a meeting today with uh, uh, MA Design, pretty well-known design architecture firm. They're actually doing a full um, update of all of our exterior packages and looking at some new roof lines and, and, and interesting color palettes and materials. So I think it'll probably be something where if we're fortunate enough to get to that stage when we get to final development plan, we might have some, some fresh uh, new elevations to show you. 
And Mr. D, just to kind of um, continue off of that thought you had there on the unit designs, that was one of the things staff had asked the applicant to do with sub area B, as well as the other sub areas, but this Greenway model here, if they took their unit um, design and their the way the unit functions now is this is your front entry, this is your rear entry. Uh -huh. If they flipped it and the rear was on like an alley yeah. mm -hmm. format, then the front could be connected to the paths via sidewalks and create right. a formal connectivity trail um, that leads throughout this subdivision. So removing basically all the sidewalks along the private drives and putting all the sidewalks in the green space to have the connectivity bleed through that way. Um, that was one of the um, feedback points we gave to try to help promote connectivity and make it feel more pedestrian oriented. Um, similar to sub area A and B, how to create alleys um, given the existing layouts they've provided. Um, and that's really the focus with sub area C here. They're showing the front of the units facing the green space front of the units facing the um, detention basin. Um, the front of the units on these buildings are facing the commercial, so they're starting to show that in the townhome mm -hmm. area. I'm yeah. um, just trying to help push and have it bleed through the rest of the development. Yeah, I think a great example of that is um, Greensview condos. So they kind of unintentionally did it, where they have all the garages and they have like the common paved space. So in a sense, it's kind of a oddly shaped alley, but it does allow, you know, for the the better part of the home to face the golf course. So it's kind of that same concept, which I, I think would be great if we could, great to pull that off. Any other questions, comments? So formal question uh, for the applicant, are, are you okay tabling this evening and taking some of the feedback? Sure. Yep, we are. Thank you. Okay. And I don't know how many folks here in the audience tonight are, are neighbors, uh, but we're going to send out uh, an invite, have a community meeting for for area residents to just Q and A and answer questions, get to know people. So, if anyone wants to stay after and give us your contact info, that would be great. If you'd like to be invited to that meeting. Okay. And since we are going to table. Uh, I'm going to hold off on opening up for the public hearing until we hear the final application for the zoning map change as well as the preliminary development plan. Uh, are there any questions or comments from staff before we proceed? Okay. Uh, so. Do we need a motion to table? Need a motion to table. Uh, we'll do these in two votes. So, okay. the zoning map and the preliminary development plan. I would make the motion that we table ZM two four zero zero three, and for additional information. Second. Second. Motion made by Ms. McDonald. Second by Ms. Gooden. Mr. D. Uh, any other further discussion? Good. Mr. Deed, roll call, please. Mr. Wildenthaler. Yes. Mr. Donahue. Yes. Ms. Gooden. Yes. Ms. McDonald. Yes. Mr. Deeds. Yes. Mr. Pelsgrove. Yes. Okay, so ZM24003 has been tabled. Same thing for the next application. Mr. Chair, I'd like to uh, move that we table uh, preliminary development plan PDP-24-001. Second. Motion made by Mr. Deed, second by Mr. Paul's group. Uh, I would say that the, the public hearing will be held at a future date on this application as well. Uh, any other further discussion? Roll call. Mr. Willenthaler. Yes. Mr. Donahue. Yes. Ms. Gooden. Yes. Ms. McDonald. Yes. Mr. Deeds. Yes. Mr. Paul's group. Yes. Okay, so PDP 24001 has been tabled. Uh, for old new business, um, the Ohio Health Project has gone vertical. Uh, they started constructing the stairwells, for those that have seen that. Mm -hmm. um, 
they are going to be actively building on that project till I believe July of next year. Uh, so that one will take uh, about 12 more months for completion. Um, the Columbus Metropolitan Library project uh, that is moving forward, they are in their final stages of their civil engineering drawings right now. Um, once those get approved, they are ready to uh, get started on build building foundations, uh, building footing of foundations. Uh, they already have, I believe, all of the site work done uh, to get that prepped. Um, we're just working on some uh, civil engineering uh, finishing touches here to get that um, ready to go as well. Um, just I don't think I have anything else. Old a, business. a quick old business note. I did see that uh, BP did remove the car wash. Yes. Uh, is there any other update on? Um, so one of the things we talked about a couple months ago, the the Del Taco application and um, anything on Home Depot in terms of uh, have they come back to city staff for for what we heard this winter in terms of outdoor storage? Yes. So um, Del Taco that uh, property is back up. Uh, for sale again. Okay. Um, so uh, we believe that uh, has fallen through. Um, for Home Depot, um, the attorney you guys met at that conditional use hearing, um, was that last year already? Uh, he um, has gotten me in touch with a design engineer that is looking at mm -hmm. making the green space behind the building uh, for outdoor storage. Um, making a secure space. Um, I just submitted, I filled out a public records request showing all the utilities that are running through the ground there um, to help them with the design. Um, it probably won't be next month that something will come forward if I haven't seen anything yet, but I know they are actively working on it. Um, so hopefully before this year's over, we get some resolution on it. Cool, thank you. Any other? Old business. Has BP come back with any other? Um, I think we gave them some feedback on their one design plan. Have they come back at all with any other changes or any other thoughts? No, I, I talked to the applicant that was at that meeting representing um, BP. Uh, at this time, they are no longer pursuing uh, doing anything at that store. Um, it may be something they do at a future date, but it's not anything on their current uh, project horizon. Is the city, uh, the property across from Walmart, the old Taylor Square, CEC Turk, uh, I understand that that's for sale. What's the, is the current owner still CEC Turk? And are they, are, are we, some, is somebody holding them accountable for the maintaining of just the, the weeds and the, the overgrowth in the building? Yeah, the, the Taylor family still owns the property. Okay. And so they are they are having the property mowed, and then the weeds, you know, our our code is eight inches, so we are monitoring that. Okay. And also building maintenance. So they had some. There was a break in last year. You can see from 33, the windows yeah. were broken out. They replaced those those windows recently. So we're trying to get them to understand that since these buildings are now vacant, they are required to maintain them. Good. Yeah, uh, the current conversation with the property owner is um, debating on uh, demolishing the buildings uh, rather than trying to maintain them if they're going to sit vacant. Um, their intent is not to let someone else rent the space that's existing. Um, so they're just trying to figure out the uh, logistics and the cost behind uh, doing that ahead of time before um, selling the site. It's becoming a common pathway across 33 going north of the, of the city. I mean, there's been several times I've gone down 33 and see children, well, young teenagers crossing over in front of the buildings. They've got the fence smashed down, and they're running across cemet to the cemetery to keep, to keep heading north. I've also seen them try to go by on a bike yeah. across there. Yeah. I will let our uh, sheriff know about that because I know the fence has been smashed or cut down right there in front of where their doors used to be to the implement dealership okay I'll let the sheriff know about that yeah. so I guess does lead into the conversation the um, the pedestrian path across 
over, over, over 33 is that just started I would say it looked like yeah. it was so I saw a lot of barrels is that the yes I assume that's yeah the, they, they started grading work it's it's underway now that'll be good I think it'll help but it'll be good all right need a motion to adjourn so moved second take your time <laughs> roll call Mr. Wildenbeller. Sure. Mr. Donahue. Yes. Ms. Gooden. Yes. Ms. McDonald. Yes. Mr. Deeds. Yes. Mr. Palsgrove. Yes. <laughs> Time out 8.25 p.m. I have to. <laughs>